So what humans do that's special is we absorb all of these ideas, all these inputs, and we smoosh them up in various ways and come up with new things. And so there are essentially three main ways that the brain does this. And we've summarized this as bending, breaking, and blending. So let's start with bending. Bending is where you take something and you, you change it, you make it smaller, you make it bigger, you change something about it. When you look at statues across human culture, you find that, that um, people bend the human form any which way, making it taller, skinnier, emphasizing certain portions over the other. They do that with all animal paintings and sculptures and so on. You can bend lots of aspects of things. So the artist J.R. made a statue of the high jumper Muhammad Idris uh, for the Olympics, and he put that at, super huge and, and had him jumping over a building. And you have other sculptors that make extremely tiny little figurines. And one of the arguments we make is that the exact same thing that's happening in art, the same cognitive processes, are happening in the sciences also. So you see exactly this kind of thing happening all the time. Just as an example, in the early days of driving, in the 1920s, headlight glare was a real problem. So Edwin Land, um, the scientist, realized that he could solve this by using polarizing crystals, but those were very big at the time. So he figured out how to shrink these down and make a windshield out of all these little polarized crystals. It's exactly the same sort of aha moment as the artist who's making these tiny figurines. It's the same kind of bend going on. And we see this all over in, in biology. Just as one example, the artificial heart, um, since it was invented in the 1980s, has been a mechanical pump. But these are very energy hungry and they get worn down. And so in 2004, a couple of physicians came up with a continuous flow heart where blood flows through and is oxygenated continuously. So if you have one of these hearts, you don't have a pulse at all. Dick Cheney has one of these and he doesn't have a pulse. And so um, this is a bend of what we find in nature. We get the idea of the heart and then we bend it to make it compatible with what we want. And of course, airplanes are, are a bend of you know, what we witnessed birds doing and so on. So there are many ways that you can bend things. And this is one of the great things that the brain does all the time. So breaking is where you take something, some input that you've received, and you bust it into pieces. Maybe you leave pieces out or something like that. So just as an example, um, the artist Cory Archangel took the video game Super Mario Brothers and he hacked into it and he removed everything except for the little clouds. And then he made an art installation where it was just the clouds and he called it Super Mario Clouds. What he was doing was taking part of it away, leaving part of it there. That same kind of overt creativity that happens in the arts is exactly what happens in the scientific lab all the time where you take certain parts away. For example, in my field, there's uh, a, a method that's used now in neuroscience called clarity, where you take the, the brain, which you can't see inside of, and you wash away all the fatty molecules so that you can see where the pathways originate and where they go. And in that way, you can essentially make part of the brain transparent. You can suddenly see the pathways. It's the exact same idea. Just as another example, um, the artist David Hockney uh, takes the, the visual field and breaks it up into pieces. And uh, the impressionist painter Seurat um, does pointillism. So there's, there's these sort of big dots and you're seeing these dots. If you come up close, you see them. If you go far away, it looks like a, a painting. And this exact same sort of breaking is the innovation that underlies our whole digital universe because there's pixelation of everything you see on a computer screen. It's a bunch of individual squares that have different colors. And at the right distance, you see me talking on a big think video. Fred Sanger was trying to figure out how to sequence long molecules of DNA. And he realized that he could break these up into smaller pieces. And then you can analyze and collate the information. And he actually ended up winning two Nobel Prizes for this work that he did. And it's the basis of essentially everything we know about genomes at this point. But it's all the same cognitive operations that are happening that you see both in the art and in the sciences. What happens in the arts is overt bending, breaking, and blending. So um, you see all kinds of art projects where people are taking things and they're bending them in, in size or texture, or they're breaking them, they're breaking pieces off, or they're blending two ideas. 
this is the basis of all of the art that we see, exactly the same mechanisms are happening in the scientific lab. It's just that typically we can't see them. So when you pick up your cell phone, it's this little rectangle that is absolutely chock full of creativity, of really brilliant ideas that went into the making of that. But you can't see it because it's just a little, you know, enclosed thing. But the interesting part is it's, it's exactly the same cognitive mechanisms, which is to say absorbing the world, bending, breaking, and blending it, and spitting out new versions of things. One of the things that we love about our computers is that we can put information in there, and then when we pull it out a year later, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same zeros and ones. The, the human brain doesn't work that way. When you put stuff in, it gets smushed up with other things that have come in before, and what comes out are you know, new versions of things. So blending is where you have two completely separate ideas, and then these become blended in the brain, and something new comes out. So just as an example, uh, in ancient mythology, we see this all throughout, where you have, uh, for example, a man and a lion, and, and you get a sphinx, or you get all over the world different combinations, a lion and a goat, and you get a, a chimera. Um, exactly the same thing happens in the lab, just as one example. Um, scientists have long wanted to harvest spider silk, which is actually stronger than steel for its size, but you can't get a bunch of spiders together or they'll eat each other. So what a geneticist did is he spliced out the gene that makes spider silk and put it in a goat and made Freckles the spider goat who secretes spider silk in her milk. She's a real life chimera. And this idea of taking two separate things and blending them is something that uh, humans do all the time. We take very different concepts and we, we put them together. Mm -hmm.